On a day, OG, when we're going to talk about being a boss, there are few people who learn leadership techniques and management techniques like we're going to learn today better than the people of our armed forces. I mean, what what a leadership organization. It's a leadership academy in and of itself. It totally is. On behalf of the men and women here in the basement at Stacking Benjamins and the men and women at Navy Federal Credit Union, let's all give a big shout out to our troops and go stack some Benjamins together. Hi, Milton. What's happening? I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to have to ask you to go ahead and move your desk again. Okay. So but no. if you could go ahead and get it as far back against that wall as possible, that would be great. No, no, because no room. So if you could just get to that as soon as possible, that would be terrific. Okay. <laughs> Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and have you recently stepped into more responsibility? Maybe you've become the boss? Well, whether you're trying to step up in your job, relationship, or with your money, so much relies on effective communication. Joining us to give us some wisdom and best practices, we welcome author, consultant, and professor at the Wharton School of Business, Rachel Pacheco. Plus, singer Britney Spears has been all over the news as she tries to break free from her conservator father so she can manage her own money. What does it mean to have a conservator? Well, we'll share our thoughts about Operation Free Britney... Later, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener, and I'll steal the show, as usual, with my award-winning trivia. And now, two guys who need to learn to communicate with me before stealing my parking spot, again, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. All right, the spot right next to the doors for OG's playing. Everybody knows that. You park the Cirrus next to the door. The hard part is getting it down the, the driveway. <laughs> yes, that is. The street, a little narrow for those wings. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Don't Do That. We're Professional Actors Podcast. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Happy Monday. We just had a great weekend, and we are all set to roll into just a fantastic week in mid-August, OG. Dog days of summer. I am in Ohio right now as people are listening to this. I've got uh, 10 degrees cooler here than we have in the basement usually. You're holding down the fort in the basement. Dad's uh, shortwave radio coming in loud and clear. Well, and I mean, we're changing some things up a little bit, but since you're not around, trying to put it in ship shape. Oh boy. Oh boy. General Eater a couple of weeks ago really had an effect on you, huh? Oh yeah. Get who we got today. Rachel Pacheco not only is... Somebody who's been on several great executive teams. She's also worked with leadership organizations around the world, like in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Indonesia, Kazakhstan. So she knows lots of different cultures. She also is a member of the founding faculty of the Entrepreneurship and Education Program at the Wharton School. She's going to teach us today about leadership and about being a brand new boss. And by the way, if you're somebody that thinks that you're a boss of nobody, anytime you have a relationship, OG, having some leadership skills, not too bad. Sometimes even for yourself. Absolutely. Rachel Pacheco coming down to the basement. We've got a fantastic headline or TikTok video minute. So many lessons, so little time. We're going to get this party started in just a moment. But first... At T-Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means they see things differently so you can focus on stacking more Benjamins. That's why they become the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes 5G in every plan. So you get it all. Unconventional thinking from T-Mobile for Business. Open Signal Awards T-Mobile as America's fastest 5G network USA. 5G user experience report July 2021. Capable device required. Coverage not available in some areas. Some uses may require certain plan or feature. See tmobile.com. For J.D. Power 2020 award information, visit jdpower.com forward slash awards. At T-Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means they see things differently so you can focus on building your stack. 
where some see another small town, T-Mobile sees businesses in need of connectivity. So they built the largest 5G network to cover cities, towns, including Texarkana and the most interstate miles in between. Where some see a color and a queue, they see an opportunity for experts to provide real-time solutions. Where some see another virtual meeting, they see 5G enabling wireless real-time translations to help your businesses succeed almost anywhere you work. Their unique approach has made T-Mobile for Business the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes benefits like 5G in every plan. So you get it all without trade-offs. Unconventional thinking, it's better for business. T-Mobile for Business. Open Signal Awards T-Mobile is America's fastest 5G network USA 5G user experience report July 2021 capable device required coverage not available in some areas some uses may require certain plan or feature ctmobile.com for JD Power 2020 award information visit jdpower.com forward slash awards all right let's move hello darlings and now it's time for your favorite part of the show our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from Investment News, written by Nicole Casperson. Britney Spears' struggle for independence puts a spotlight on conservatorships. If you aren't familiar with what's going on with Britney Spears, then good for you. Because <laughs> you're not Congratulations. Watching, you're not reading anything or watching any TV which is uh, probably a great place to be. But Nicole writes, Britney Spears in her ongoing fight for financial freedom is drawing new attention to the broken side of a conservatorship system that's meant to protect individuals with special needs. Spears' outcry in June to enter 13-year conservatorship raises questions around the validity of that conservatorship while highlighting the need for increased federal protections for the roughly 1.3 million Americans with disabilities who are directly affected. This can be incredibly frustrating the way the system works, OG, but let's dive into conservatorship because I know we've got some people out there that are, you know, worried about people in their family that may have special needs. Maybe not like Britney Spears, who her family thought might have had some mental struggles, but maybe somebody who has permanent special needs. Well, it's so slippery, right? I mean, anytime there's money involved, that's where there's going to be conflict. And you can see that anytime... Someone who doesn't have a lot of something, you know, great grandma, lived to be 116, passes away. And all of a sudden, like, Cousin Eddie's like, who's getting the Buick? You know, and you're like, we're still at the funeral home, Cousin Eddie. Is it cool if we just hang out here for a little bit? Right. But, um, I mean, she had a nice china cabinet. I'm just saying, I I remember talking to her one time. She said I was supposed to get that. You know, anytime that there's something that it just changes people instantaneously. And obviously with Britney Spears situation, super successful, tons of money involved, and also probably had some mental health issues and, and some other issues, you know, that that probably in the moment made sense to have somebody help her out. But this is true no matter where you are in your life, whether it's something for, you know, a special needs child or or grandchild, or you know, you're 43 like me and you've got young kids because my kids can't manage money. They need somebody in charge of them. You have to be very thoughtful about how you want to put other people in charge of your stuff if you're not able to do that. There's lots of ways to kind of have the checks and balances, but man, it's always going to be a struggle. And I don't think, by the way, that you can just let it go because then you end up with the court provided one, which may or may not be the way that you would have it happen. You know, like we talk about estate planning and it's like, you already have an estate plan. Your state has an estate plan for you. That's kind of where this falls. If you pass away with money and you're leaving it to someone and you haven't already identified how to handle it on their behalf, then the court says, no, we got it. We know what to do. We're going to do it this way. Just dump the money in treasury bills. And uh, when they're 18, they get it. So bada boom, bada bing. Easy peasy. Maybe that's not what you want to have happen. This piece says that uh, it's also known as guardianships, conservatorships and guardianships interchangeable. My understanding is that is not actually true, that a conservatorship is specifically money. Guardianship is also the well-being, right? So if somebody is has guardianship and conservatorship, they handle both the money and the lifestyle stuff. But you can have, as an example, set up in your estate plan, a different guardian to take care of your kids than somebody to handle the money, right? Sure. And maybe the courts use the terms interchangeably 
you know, depending on the age of the person that's being discussed. So maybe that's the confusion. That's one of the ways that you can have the checks and balances is maybe you've got the person in your family who's great with kids and who kind of believes in child raising the way that you do. And you're like, you know, if something happens to me, I want that person to be in charge of my kids. But they're really stupid with money. And so you can have somebody else be in charge of the money. Here's the thing, though. If you have a different person, and I like that because how many people do you know that are phenomenal with kids, but horrible with money? I know plenty of people like that. 11 out of 10 people are like that. <laughs> if I'm going to set this up where I have two separate people, though, I want to make sure that the conservator, the person in charge of the money is somebody that's going to do what I want them to do, not just do whatever they decide to do. And I'm not sure what special testing I put that person through to do that. But then the second thing, OG, they have to be somebody who's okay with not being friends with a guardian because you're setting up this adversarial relationship ahead of time. You're setting up this relationship where these people are not going to like each other because the guardian's job is going to be to ask for money and the conservative job is going to be to question every expense. Yeah. I mean, look, there's a reason there's three branches of government. That's how we do it in our country. And some people may say it's working or not working, but I think it's important to have some some checks and balance, especially if you're talking about a lifetime of responsibility. If you've done a great job in your financial plan and you have accumulated boatloads of money, or if you're on your way to accumulating boatloads of money, your estate's probably very large. The person in charge of the money isn't accumulating that money along the way with you, experiencing all the ups and downs. They're not experiencing that. They get the, and now you got hit by a bus and here's $8 million. Don't screw it up, please, because it's for my kids. And now if that person or those people haven't had that experience, it's like winning the lottery because then other people get in their ear. You heard about this with Britney Spears' dad, right? Well, I, should, I mean, this is, this is a big project. I should get paid a little bit, right? I mean, it's it's fair. 15, what do you think? 15, 18,000 a month? That seems pretty reasonable to keep track of all this. So what's reasonable? What's fair? What's, you know, all of that stuff you have to think about ahead of time. And you can do it on your own or you can do it with the help of a, of a pro and, and get an estate plan done. But if you don't, you leave other people to try to figure this out. You know, other people don't know the 4% rule. It's just not a thing. You don't learn that in like physics class in 11th grade. Even at the end, my understanding is Britney Spears' dad was blaming it on a third party that he had hired that was continually, sure. like when there was plenty of bad guy stuff thrown his way, he's like, no, 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 it's not me. I hired this third party who is uh, really the ones ripping, ripping them well, off. Well, sure. Don't you don't want to, <laughs> you're not going to kill the golden goose. You're going to. Pass no, but buck. I think there's also a point there. How many times have you seen banks, which are often named as the administrators in these things, mm -hmm. not really take care of anything except their own wishes? Well, again, figure out where the alignment is. That The big story that happened a couple of years ago, and we talked about it on the show, it's probably been three years now, was the, the woman whose husband was the former CEO of American Airlines. And talk about money. <laughs> there's, and the setup there, if, if you didn't catch it some years ago, was the fine folks at J.P. Morgan Chase and their trust department figured out pretty quickly that if nobody got involved, they were, you know, making millions of dollars a month in trust fees. If mama wanted her money and the kids wanted their money, then they start losing their trust fees. So what they decided to do was basically create conflict in that relationship, the, the wife and the kids, so that it would be a court case, so that it would drag out for years and years and years, which, of course, it did so that they would keep getting their trust administration fees. And they lost, you know, and had to pay all the money. But that doesn't fix relationships. What's that your, doesn't fix... What's your recourse there? I mean, if you're going to set it up ahead of time to avoid a situation like that, do you name, make sure that if there is a bank involved, which on some degree, on some level, you can see that, right? Bank people know what they're doing, but do you put... <laughs> but do you put it... Bank but, people but you put know somebody, what they're doing. They do. Yeah, well, but sure. they know a hell of a lot more than your cousin Bob who just, yeah, sure. you know, is responsible with his own, his own stuff. They at least know the rules. Do you set it up where cousin Bob is in charge of overseeing the bank? Is that what you do? Like add another layer? Well, I think everybody's gonna be different in the way that they want to handle this. I can tell you what we did. So we have somebody who's in charge of the money is different than the person who is in charge of the kids. So we've made that distinction for a lot of reasons. The person who's in charge of the money only gets a third of the vote. So we have three people in charge of the money, one person who's in charge of the day-to-day -day stuff, 
and three people who have to kind of sign off on anything out of the ordinary. And I'll let them decide what's out of the ordinary. You know, if the person who's going to be in charge of my kids has a kid and now they have to take care of my kids, is it reasonable for them to say, I think I need a new vehicle because now I got to call four kids around, not one. I think that's totally reasonable. Does that vehicle mean it should be a Ferrari? Probably unreasonable. I think we need to make some improvements to the home because now we have to take care of these other kids. Totally reasonable. Do I need to move to a 30-acre house that's worth $11 million in the, in the woods? Probably unreasonable. So that's kind of where I'm hoping that the other people will, will be able to you know, have the other votes that support that. Yeah. The other thing that we did was we put in specific mile marks along the way, as well as our expectations. They're not held to it, but our expectations around what really should happen. You know, there's this amount of estate. And if you're being reasonable, my expectations would be, even though I'm cold and dead in the ground, that you're not going to spend more than three or 4% of it a year. You know, obviously some years that may change, but on the whole, I would expect that this be the number. So I put some, at least guidelines in there and that other people might say, I don't know why I put that in there, but you know, we've been running at 6% the last five years. What's going on? Just as some conversation. So I don't know. Also you're dead. So whatever. (laughs) I agree with this piece that uh, abuses to the system. Like, we may or may not be seeing with the Britney Spears situation. Very, very infrequent. You usually see the system works pretty well. Yeah, where the frustration happens is it doesn't happen that it doesn't work. It happens that it doesn't work the way that they think it should work. Right. And whoever the they is, right? The they is the kid who's supposed to get the money. The they is the person who's in charge of the money. You know, that's why it's important for you to have these conversations with your family, have these uh, have these things thought out and written down, even if it's even if it's non-enforceable. At least it gives people a, a sense of how your decision making would be. But the last thing that I'll say on this is I would recommend everybody reads the book The Ultimate Gift. Really teeny tiny book. I don't know if you've ever seen this, Joe. It's about uh it's a parable. I love parable books like, you know, Built to Sell and the E Myth and like where you you're kind of like one of the people in the story. You're you know, you're following Herbie around. You're figuring out why he's holding up the line and you know, that's the goal. Uh, Ultimate Gift is a great, really quick, easy read about uh, a person who passed away and had tons of money and had entrusted his longtime friend and, and lawyer to dole out the estate and um, kind of the lessons along the way. So kind of a, a cool way to think about giving and estate planning. The Ultimate Gift. We'll link to that on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Also, we'll have a guide to even more resources and places where we've talked about estate planning In our guide to the show, stackybenjamins.com forward slash stacker is where you sign up for that for free and you can kind of play the at home game. Hey, time for our TikTok minute OG. This is where we pull up a TikTok video, find some TikTok genius. And sometimes I say genius sarcastically. Sometimes we actually do have some genius this week. Well, I'll let you find out. You familiar with Nicola stock? Nope. Nikola is the electric vehicle manufacturer where the founder was indicted on three counts of fraud. And back at the end of July, a federal grand jury said he was uh, found guilty of lying, quote, about nearly all aspects of the business. Uh, Securities fraud, wire fraud, making false statements back in September when he stepped on as chairman of the board. Nikola, a stock that has been hyped quite a bit. Well, Here's our TikTok wizard talking about Nikola. I see this comment a lot saying that they're not going to lease cars for four years. So what if someone told you if you invest $25,000 into Tesla four or five years ago, you would have over $400,000 in your account? Would you do it? Same thing with Nikola. In four years, what if you have $250,000 in your account and just invest in $25,000? Would you do it? Or sleep on it. Would you sleep on it or would you do it? If you knew they were making cars in four years, dollar cost average in. I'm going to sleep on it. Might not do it. There's there's uh, some difficulty here. On one hand, this is a trap I think we have all fallen into before. Because I know I have. You know what? The stock is low. There's bad stuff happening right now, OG. What could go worse? 
If they're going to release a car in four years, I'm going to buy as many shares as I can now. That's one way to do it. There's a couple difficulties. Difficulty number one is how do you stay solvent when you have no income coming in for four years? You have to rely on mm -hmm. outside investors. Doesn't mean they can't do it, but it means outside investors are going to have to come in and keep that company afloat. And when your founder has been indicted on uh, fraud charges, does that make your story a little bit uh, more difficult? You would think so. Um, anything that you're doing that involves individual stock is going to be a gamble. If you want to gamble 25 grand on any stock, then you're narrowly focusing your whole strategy, your whole thesis into one singular idea versus the United States. <laughs> or it's like, what's going to do better? This one property, this one single family house in the outskirts of Atlanta? or a REIT. Well, I would say the REIT overall, but there's always the chance. And that's why individual stock ownership or individual rental property ownership still exists is because you go, well, maybe, maybe this 25 K does turn into 400. Maybe it does or it turns into zero. But I think looking at the way poker players play, I think is important if you're going to take that bet that you're talking about. I'm with you at some point, there's a leap of faith because there's future information that's going to come out that we don't know. So we have to, though, decrease the chance of that future information getting in our way. And I think the way we do that is we look at track record, we understand the books, we look at things like free cash flow and debt, we look at sales agreements that they've signed. I feel like the more we know about the company and we know generally where they should go, we get a feeling about the heartbeat. So don't you think that still betting on something because, hey, they're going to make a car in four years versus, well, I know that they've already publicly said that they're going into talks with these companies. They already have these companies on board to sell the product. We already know that they have zero debt. We, we can see the number, the free cash flow number looks good. Like all of these, all these things that we use when we look at our own finances, we can do that when we look at an individual stock. I think it doesn't guarantee we're going to win, but it certainly helps us stack the deck in our favor. Right. Do some research ahead of time, huh? Oh, that's crazy talk. What are you talking about? Speaking of research ahead of time, I should have looked up what day it is. I just looked up what day it is and I'm not going to steal Doug's thunder, but holy cow, why have we not been paying attention to this day? All right, uh, let's go get some coffee and uh, go say hi to Rachel Pacheco upstairs talking to mom while we find out from Doug a little bit about today's holiday. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And did you know today is National Tell-A-Joke Day? According to T. Oaken on Apple Podcasts, we already have, quote, way too many jokes that aren't funny. Doug has to go. Well, T, I think you and I could be friends, and in the spirit of renewed focus on depth and seriousness, we're boycotting this holiday. Seriously, like, for example, on a day like today, we never stoop to tell a joke like, how do you talk to giants? You use big words. Or worse yet, could you imagine if we tried to slip this one past you? Like, uh, what animal has more lives than a cat? Frogs, they croak every day. Yeah, good thing we're not doing that horrible joke today. You know, one guy who has never been one for joking is today's birthday boy, Steve Carell. There are no more serious shows than The Office. So today's question is, what year did The Office debut? I'll be back faster than you can remain completely serious, like me. When you become a member of Navy Federal Credit Union, life gets better because all these things that come with adulting can be so hard, like getting money saved, avoiding debt, uh, making sure that when you get paid that you funnel the money automatically to the right places, buying a car, all those in one spot, right? You're saving up for the, for the car. You're trying to figure out what the down payment would be if you can't pay cash for the whole thing and you need a ride. And then you have to look at comparing interest rates. You want to take a look at the down payment amount. How can you maybe pay less for the car? What's a good interest rate? And that's why Navy Federal created a fully loaded car buying experience for you. You can finance, buy, protect, and enjoy your auto purchase all through one convenient place. They have low rates and pre-approval, good for 90 days, so you know 
what you can afford when you're shopping. You'll save thousands off MSRP with the thing I love, Navy Federal's car buying service powered by TrueCar. You'll also get exclusive member savings with Carfax, with Geico, and with SiriusXM. They're always available with 24-7 member service representatives to answer any questions. You'll learn more at NavyFederal.org slash car buying. It's NavyFederal.org slash car buying. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Your actual savings off MSRP may vary. Navy Federal Credit Union is federally insured by NCUA. Hey, stackers, people ask us all the time, what other shows go well, almost like uh, meat and potatoes, right? With the Stacking Benjamin Show, or if you're a vegan, I don't know, uh, carrots and uh, kale. I, 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 don't, I don't know. But I do know this, that if you like the stories and some of the compelling takeaways from the Stacking Benjamin Show, a great one to punch then is to go to my friend Jordan Harbinger Show. The Jordan Harbinger Show you can find wherever you're listening to us now. Jordan is a master at bringing out so much. It's a show that's entertaining. It's informative. It's packed with actionable content. I'm not the only one that feels that. Jordan Harbinger show was named best of Apple to that list in 2018. So don't just ignore my suggestion when it comes to this, as you might, my movie suggestions, my board game suggestions. I'm not the only one that thinks this is an awesome show. He dives into the minds of fascinating people from athletes, authors, and scientists to mobsters, spies, and hostage negotiators. By the way, if you've never heard his story about being taken hostage, well, then you've got, uh, you got something coming there. He's got so many shows. What are some lately? He's got two parts with this amazing dude, Ulrich the Mole Larson, who was undercover in North Korea, part one and part two. That is just amazing. Uh, Frank Agmagnoli, Scam Me If You Can, is the name of this episode. I absolutely love this one as well. He's a huge scam artist. And you know what? Because his show's a lot like ours, and he's constantly sending you in a different direction, Simon Sinek. What is your why? And where do you find, of course, Simon Sinek? If you have not seen the TED Talk with Simon Sinek, listen to Jordan's episode with him, then watch Simon's TED Talk, and then write me, and you can thank me later for all three of those. But those are three. He then, on Fridays, has his uh, Friday show where he gets Friday feedback. It is incredible. So wherever you're listening to us now, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show. You can't go wrong with adding it to your rotation Search for Jordan Harbinger, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening to us now. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and in honor of boycotting National Tell-A-Joke Day, I've scrubbed all of the humor from this script. Honestly, it wasn't that hard. While you might think that nothing's unusual, can you believe that this document was chock full of dumb jokes until I put the kibosh on that nonsense? I mean, I'm no joke expert, but why include this one? Why wasn't the letter delivered? It was stationary. I mean, why would I even, who would put that in here? I wouldn't. This one's you know, laughable. I mean, like, you know, in the, in the bad way. Uh, how can you tell when a bike is thinking? Their wheels are turning. You know what? Uh, I'm just going to be serious, mature adults, and get back to today's trivia question. Turns out, jokes can pay, as today's birthday boy and star of the hit TV series The Office is worth an estimated 80 million bucks. And our question was, what year Steve Carell's version of The Office first debuted? And if you guessed the totally serious year of 2005, you'd be correct. Now it's time to step up your boss game with Rachel Pacheco. Got the note-taking stuff ready? You're going to need it. Take it away, Joe. And here she comes down to the basement. Rachel Pacheco's here. How are you? I'm doing great. It was a great catch up with your mom and I'm excited to catch up with you now. Well, I'm glad that you could put Texarkana on the world tour and I'm sure you don't get <laughs> many opportunities to stop in a beautiful city like ours, Rachel. Happy to be here. Let's kick this off because you got a great tip, I think, that's a good start to our discussion from a friend of yours named Sandy. Tell me Sandy's story. So Sandy was 
one of the first people I met when I became the chief people officer of a small healthcare startup, Sandy and I, like most of the other employees, we, we grabbed coffee and Sandy had just been promoted to a role as manager. And Sandy had actually joined the startup two years earlier, fresh out of college and was a superstar performer and doing really well in her role. And of course, promoted to a manager as the startup grows. And so I'm sitting with Sandy and we're chatting and Sandy had just gotten her first performance review back uh, that talked about feedback from her team and her direct reports. And Sandy was almost in tears because it became really clear that Sandy was awful at managing. She had been a high performer through college and through school and in her first role, and she just was terrible at managing. And the, the folks she was managing were miserable. Sandy was miserable. And what I realized was that most people in the organization just had no idea how to manage I and mean, were put in positions of management without any training or role models or, or resources to be successful in this role. I, I talked to a bunch of founders and CEOs and the conversation is, is pretty typical in that they say, hey, you know, can you train our team on management? We need better management skills. My pushback is, is well, management is a whole bunch of different things. It's how do you set goals for your team? How do you give feedback? How do you have difficult conversations? How do you fire someone? How do you create a team culture? And what I try to emphasize is the idea that management is a whole bunch of skills and we need to work and build each of them to be a great manager. It's just not one monolithic thing. I remember talking to Ashley Goodall about this, uh, who with Marcus Buckingham wrote this great piece for the Harvard Business Review talking about how important it is that we train our managers as well. Because when we talk about culture, Rachel, you've seen it at the different companies that you've been involved with, that you've consulted with. Creating this culture really comes down to having a management team that can empower your people. It's so true. And yeah, I love Ashley and Marcus's piece on performance management and I use it quite a bit. And I would just add one thing and that's, we're going through this period of the great resignation, as folks are calling it, where... People are essentially fleeing their jobs and people leave jobs because of their managers. And so even more so now, we have such a responsibility in in being great managers and training great managers. Our teams will flee and, you know, folks will leave and, and we won't be able to keep and retain great talent. And so I just think it's so important for companies and organizations to invest in building a great set of managers. It's funny when you say great set of managers, you point out in the introduction to your book that this isn't just managing people at work. I mean, this this is even great, you say, (laughs) for spouses. And I even think about people ask me all the time about what questions should I ask a financial planner? How do I set expectations? This is really life advice as much as anything, Rachel. Probably my favorite quote in the whole book came from a conversation I was having with a, a dear friend about dating. You know, she was dating this guy and it wasn't going quite well and didn't know what to do and all this kind of stuff. And her dad actually said to her, well, an expectation unarticulated is a disappointment guaranteed. So essentially, if you don't tell the guy what you're looking for, what you want out of the relationship, you're going to be disappointed. Expectation setting is the first chapter in my book, and I think it should be the the first chapter in any new relationship or any new marriage, because it absolutely carries over from the workplace to the home and and beyond. I totally agree with that. Although I read sometimes from money nerds that if you sit down and talk about your credit score on date number one, I mean, maybe that's (laughs) fine. It just isn't where true romance always begins. Why don't we set clear expectations? Because it seems like everybody wants them, right? I want to know how to succeed, but why don't we do that? I think for new managers, There are two primary things. The first is new managers are petrified of being perceived as micromanagers. So we've all had micromanagers in the past, someone who gets way too deep into your work business, doesn't get off your back when you're doing work. So when we become managers, we say, well, we're never going to be a micromanager. And we're going to be the fun hit manager that doesn't tell our team what to do and, and isn't quote unquote bossy. So because of this fear of micromanagement, we aren't clear around what we want and what we expect from our team members, or, you know, we're not even clear around when a a project or a task is due. 
The second reason why we often don't set clear expectations, it's actually this effect called the Dunning-Kruger effect these two economists developed. And that's when we're really good at something, we underestimate the time and the knowledge it takes to get something done. So we're not setting clear expectations because we just assume that our team member knows how to do it and that they know exactly what's expected and that we don't have to make something that's really easy for us We don't need to be clear about that with our team members. I had to laugh because I had this happen to me, Rachel, in seventh grade math. Like the reason (laughs) I became a a math nerd much later on was because in seventh grade, I had this teacher and I really already had this complex that, that I felt like I was behind in everything. And I just felt like life was moving fast and I couldn't keep up. And he puts this stuff on the board behind him. And then he would go, but of course you already know that. And he'd erase it right away. (laughs) And I feel like since then, I see that all the time around me. People like, but you already know that. And assuming that we already know that I think is difficult. And I feel like also the downside, like for me to overcome that math hurdle was so big. You had it with a report named Michael. Yeah. Michael was the the first person I managed and probably the story that sticks with me the most. We were working at a consulting firm. He was my first direct report and I didn't know how to manage and I did a really terrible job. I wasn't clear around what he needed to do to be successful. I wasn't clear on what I expected from him, any of these things. And so unsurprisingly, he, he failed at his job. It was probably 50% me and 50% that it wasn't the right fit for him it sticks with me because it's a reminder of how much responsibility we have in our role as managers to help our team members succeed. Michael ended up exiting the organization. It was my first conversation where I had to to let someone go. And that was really formative. Part of the reason why I'm still okay with sharing the story and I feel good about it as an example is that Michael ended up leaving the consulting firm, ended up going to Harvard Law School and clerking for a Supreme Court judge. So the role was not right for him. And perhaps if I had been a better manager, he would be toiling away as a consultant now, as opposed to, you know, his, his true calling, which was to be an incredibly successful lawyer. Well, that's what I thought when I read that was how often do these rock stars slip through our fingertips because of the fact that we don't have the skills to do our job better. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get clear then. Let's talk about how we set expectations. You say there's four things that we need to do to set clear expectations for people around us. Yeah. And I call it the super simple four pronged approach. The power is in actually doing them and going through each of these steps, which is what we often don't do. And so the first prong, the first step is stating the objective or the end goal. So, you know, why do we need this work product? What are we trying to achieve with this work? What impact will it have? So this is really the why. Like two, you're showing them what the top of the mountain looks like, like before the hike, Like you're showing Mm -hmm. them how beautiful things are going to be when we finish this. Absolutely. I love that analogy because it's also not mapping out the trail for them to get to the top of the mountain. That's micromanaging. It's what the top of the mountain looks like. And then your team member finds the path and that becomes really powerful and meaningful for them. The second step is what does good look like? Can we be specific about what we think quality is? So oftentimes we gloss over this and we we say, I want you to create a, a great work plan. And our objective is a work plan that it tells us where things stand and, and status, et cetera. But we don't actually get into what good looks like in a work plan. I want to focus on the downside of not doing that because you tell mm. a great story about a woman named Diane who, who really fails to tell her report what good looks like. And uh, he thinks he's doing a great job. Yeah. The story of Diane, and this is both one story and something that I've seen subsequent times with with new managers, especially in startups. We say we want someone to be really proactive on our team. So we say we have an expectation for you to, to be proactive. We want proactive team members, and that's super important for our company. And so then we pat ourselves on the back because we say, I just set a clear expectation. I've told my team member that I want them to be proactive. And so the team member thinks he's being proactive and goes about his his merry way. And then the manager is really upset and frustrated because the team member isn't being proactive. 
The challenge is that we've never defined what proactive is in our minds. So we didn't define that on my team and, and for my direct reports, proactive is sending an agenda 24 hours before our one-on-one -on -one meetings. Proactive in my mind is coming to me with solutions instead of just problems when you identify an issue. Proactive is doing as much strategic thinking as you can about an issue as opposed to just doing desk research. It feels like taking these kind of strategic overarching things and making them more tactile. Like Absolutely. what specifically do you do that makes it a win? Yeah. And not just new managers, most managers, they get to that first level, but they don't go to those subsequent levels that really get specific and get tactical. Yeah. I'm right there. We have a team and I feel like when a lot of the time to your friend's dad's point, when my team doesn't meet expectations, it's usually that I didn't lay out the right stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to take a little detour there because I thought that was really important. The next step. So then the next step is just what's the timing? When do we want something by? How much time should be spent doing this task? And again, a lot of new managers just don't state the timing. We have a fear of stepping on someone's toes or again, being bossy. And so we aren't clear around the, the timing that's needed for a project. And then the fourth is providing examples, you know, as best you can as a manager, provide examples of work product or information or content that aligns with the objective of this, this task you've assigned so that your team member can get closer and closer to understanding what you truly expect from them. I feel like as I'm listening to you talk, I feel like we worry too much about being a micromanager, right? That we don't worry enough maybe about being granular. And you've got a story about a guy, a guy actually, I think his name, was his name? J Josh Hardy? Was it Josh Hardy? <laughs> That name has been changed. Uh, well, Josh, Josh what, what, what you actually pay him a compliment. I yeah. mean, I mean, you really, it doesn't yeah. start off as a compliment because you say that he's like a bad mullet, right? <laughs> business in front and business in the back where everybody else at this internship is getting along with their boss. Your guy's kind of nitpicky. He's doing yeah. all these little things, but this ended up working out really well. Yeah. I owe my career success to what we called him. No party, Josh Hardy, <laughs> just because he was nitpicky. He, it was likely not comfortable for him, not fun for him, but he took his role as a manager very seriously. And, and he gave me constant feedback around ways I could improve. I rolled my eyes and groaned and complained about him behind his back. But over time, I realized that he set me off on a different trajectory by really having the courage to give me hard feedback from the get-go. Why do we dislike feedback so much? Oh, so many reasons. The one I think is, is most important and not often talked about is we dislike feedback because it feels like a threat to our social standing, to our identity, to who we are as people. And so when we receive feedback, we actually code feedback the same way that we code a physical threat, like a lion chasing us, uh, you know, back when we were cavemen and women. And so we immediately get defensive and it feels immediately um, uncomfortable. So it's in our biological nature to hate feedback because it feels like a threat. When I was with American Express, one of my first managers gave me some great feedback. He said, I've had to learn, Joe, that when I give you feedback, I can't look at you. Because if I look at you while I'm giving you feedback, your eyes are staring daggers into me and everything about you is saying, F off. And, and he said, but then, so I think as Joe leaves the room that he's not taking any of this, yeah. that he hates my guts. He goes, and then the weird thing is, I got to think about what Joe's going to do the next day because Joe always comes in the next day and goes, okay, Jeff, I changed everything. I did all the stuff you said and I love it and it's great. So I've had to learn from that too, by the way, that feedback from him that I have to kind of control my F you face yeah. when, when you're telling me what you think. I love that story because one of the first pieces of feedback I got when I was a consultant was that I needed to control my facial expressions because it was too emotive. And I was so taken aback and so offended by this. Like, oh, I can't, you know, raise one eyebrow when a client says something that I don't like. They told me to practice talking in front of a mirror so oh. that I could manage my facial expressions 
Did that work? It did. It actually worked. Yeah. Cause then and, you, you could yeah. see, you could see yourself then and imagine the other person then I think seeing you. Yeah. And frankly, Zoom has helped a lot too, right? We now have a, a video of ourselves staring back at us when we're talking and when we're in meetings. Giving feedback to people I think is, is super hard. How do we give feedback? And I want to point out two different people that I have trouble giving feedback to. Number one, over my career, giving feedback to people who are older than me, mm. right? Uh, and then second, there's, you know, even rock stars need feedback and giving somebody who's doing phenomenally well, giving them feedback about that will make them perform even better. How do you, how do you address those? Yeah. The first one, this one comes up a lot, you know, especially in, in startup organizations, there's two things. The first is just a a general kind of rule of thumb. You know, when we're in positions of management like that is being vulnerable and making sure you share what you don't know with the people you're managing. And so you're, you're okay saying, I don't, I don't know, as opposed to coming across as super confident and super cocky to someone who has 15 years more experience than you. And that just falls completely flat. So saying, you know, I haven't done this as long as you, but I observed this in our meeting and this is how it affected the team and then have a conversation about it. Uh, so feedback, I, I find, starting from an objective place of data, just explaining the situation helps to lower the emotion of the conversation. And the other important thing is a feedback conversation isn't about right versus wrong. It's about how I perceived your behavior and how that behavior impacted me or impacted the team or impacted the client. And let's have a conversation around that behavior and how it might change or it it could be improved upon. It's not a litigating, you did this wrong, I did this right, who's going to win this discussion, which is often how we approach it. Well, and I feel like, Rachel, that's why your discussion about giving feedback often, I think, is super important. Because if you've got this feedback loop where you're getting feedback from somebody a lot, it's going to feel a lot less confrontational. Now, we just have a growth mentality. We're all trying to get better. It's part of how we work, what we do, who we are. The worst is feedback that's really surprising. Or, you know, we think, why why now? You haven't given me feedback in six months. And now today you decide to give me feedback? What did I do? What's, is this must be huge. Am I getting fired tomorrow if now you decide to give me feedback? And especially if then it's something small, right? If it's something really little, then after six months, you're like, why, why this? Why today? This must be huge. Absolutely. Um, I noticed that your feedback loop, the way that you describe giving feedback to people does not involve the sandwich concept. I, I hate the sandwich. <laughs> I hate the sandwich. We do the sandwich, the, let me give a piece of positive feedback, a piece of constructive feedback, and then a piece of positive feedback to soften the blow, right? As opposed to us just in a concise, precise, and direct way saying, hey, I observed this, this is the impact, and, and here's how you might change your behavior moving forward uh, and making it not a big deal. The sandwich just blows things up. But if it is your first time giving feedback, you do have a step-by-step like way that we should do that. Yeah, so it starts from a place of data and observation. So I might say, Joe, I observed that you came to our meeting 15 minutes late. So it's just an observation. And you might immediately say, I missed the bus. And that's the end of the feedback conversation. So I say, hey, I observed you came into the meeting 15 minutes late. I then explain how it affected me, the client, the project, the team. And this is really the, why am I giving this feedback? Why does it matter? Why is it important? So when you explain the impact, the person understands that this, this matters as opposed to this is just a petty complaint that this person has. So, Hey Joe, I observed you came into the meeting 15 minutes late. It, it really impacted the team and that it derailed the meeting in when we lost, you know, 15 minutes of, of work time. And additionally, it, I felt slightly disrespected um, because you've come to my meetings late the last three times. And then importantly, you pause for clarification and ask questions and say, hey, what's your reaction to this? Or, or what do you think about this? And it gives the opportunity for a dialogue and a conversation. And then you end with suggesting a change in behavior. 
So what can this person do differently moving forward? And that last step is really important for two primary reasons. First, it shows that you care enough about the person that you thought about how they can change their behavior. And the second, it shows that the feedback is actionable. It's not something that's intrinsic to who the person is and that they can't change. So if we give a piece of feedback that we don't have a way that the person can change, then is that the right piece? Is that the right feedback to be giving? So we want to make sure our feedback is actionable and that the person can change as opposed to this is just who this person is. And I'm nitpicking them on their personality or something intrinsic to who they are. And I'm thinking as you're speaking about how the best feedback I think that I ever received aligns 100% with what you just outlined this woman, Renee, who was in charge of the speakers at American Express, she gave me the feedback that I was always 10 minutes late. She took me aside and said, this is the third time that you're 10 minutes late. She said, and what's frustrating is you are so talented at what you do. You are so incredibly talented and you have so much help that you can be to the organization. And yet, I don't know that you know this, but nobody takes you seriously because you always show up late and you're clearly not taking us seriously. I was never late again, Rachel. And then she taught me how to make sure that I wasn't late again. It was, oh my goodness. It's still, it was 30 years ago and it still is like a punch in the gut every time I think about how I disrespect people when I'm late. I mean, Renee gave you a gift. I like to call feedback like underwear. It's a gift. <laughs> You don't really want, but you really need. I you read know, you, you writing under it for your birthday. <laughs> I don't want it, but I know I need it. You talk about so many things today. We went over just individuals, teams, and managing yourself. I want to end this with something that I think is super powerful, which is you point out to new managers, don't make somebody else responsible for your development. Be the king or queen of your own development. Talk about how I do that. Yeah. So a lot of times we just expect our organization writ large to tell us what to do and to tell us where to develop and to tell us the capabilities or skills we should, we want to build. I think it's really important for us to think through where do I want to develop? How can I be empowered to chart the path that I want to take and then go out and seek the resources and build the capabilities that are required to do that? I use a quick example that ties into the first thing we talked about. A lot of folks say, in my long-term development, I want to be a manager. That's my long-term development goal. And then we wait to get a direct report assigned to us. And that's when we, quote unquote, become a manager, as opposed to, I want to become a manager. So what are all the skills and capabilities that are required to be a manager? And let me go start building them now and seeking out places in my organization where I can test and practice those skills that are required to be a great manager. The book is called Bringing Up the Boss, Practical Lessons for New Managers. It's a fantastic handbook. Rachel, I'm assuming we can get this everywhere. You can get it everywhere. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks for hanging out and nerding out about being a good boss and about uh, No Party Josh Hardy. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, I'm Rob Berger. When I'm not rolling in the dough, that's right. I'm stacking Benjamins. Thanks again to Rachel for hanging out. There's so many lessons, I think, for all of us. My favorite, though, was don't wait for somebody else to set your curriculum. Oh, gee. Mm -hmm. if, if, if there are things you need to know to be better at your job, don't wait for your company. Don't wait for your manager. Don't wait for somebody else to teach how to be good at it. If you want that next promotion, I love what Rachel talks about. Go and get the education yourself. Be the... What's, what's the line from that Robin Williams movie? Be the captain of your ship. I don't know that one, but okay. The one where they stand on the desk. Uh, standing on the desk, yeah, I'm not sure. Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? The, the, the one where they stand on the desk. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's I only that. one movie, one Robin Williams movie where they stand on the desk. Sorry. Oh, you're killing me. Everybody's hearing me type. Robin Williams, stand on desk. Here we go. Stand on desk. It, it even shows up as a... That's the thing. Oh, Captain, my captain uh, is the speech and Dead Poet Society. Dead Poet Society. There it is. See, I'm guarantee there's another movie where Robin Williams is standing on a desk. I don't think there is. Okay. I mean, that's an iconic scene. But she reminded me of uh, management guru Tom Peters. 
that I read earlier in my career. And I think we should hear this refrain from pros more often to go get that. Rachel did today. Tom said, I don't know anybody who gets out of bed in the morning, OG, and goes, you know what? I'm going to suck today. I can't wait to be mediocre. (laughs) Nobody says that. And yet we act like we want to be mediocre because we wait for somebody else to do the heavy lifting. We don't go find those people that can make us better at whatever it is we, we need to do. So many lessons here besides bringing up boss. Who was the person who really impacted you when it came to the working world? Because I think Tom Peters might have been mine. Yeah, I mean, for me, I've read a ton of stuff, but one of the first people that I worked with at American Express, I remember the conversation of, I was having a hard time. Everything in sales initially is always scripted, right? Like if you're a salesperson and you get a job in sales, they say, this is how you sell this thing. And as you get better knowing your stuff, then you know, then it's more of a conversation and less of a quote unquote sale. But, um, but early in my career, I was having really tough times having those initial conversations with people. And the person that I was working with said, he listened to me bellyache for, you know, an hour and then said, cool. Well, anyways, uh, on Monday, I'd like you to teach the initial meeting, all the new people. Uh, so, uh, please do that for me on Monday. And I was like, no, no, did you not hear the last hour? Okay. I can't do it for myself. How am I going to teach? He said, I know, but also don't screw up my new people. Cause I'll be really mad. Obviously, you know, the, what ended up happening there, which was, I got really good at teaching it, which meant I was really good at doing it. You know? So when you get to the part in your business where you can actually teach the stuff that you're doing, then you've kind of gotten to that level of mastery. So, uh, so that was kind of a interesting turn in my turn in my life. I think there's two things going on there. I think number one is to get that feedback, but number two, to recognize how valuable it is, right? Recognize that this, this could be a turning point. Oh, I didn't recognize it in real time. You didn't recognize it? God, no, I was so mad. I might not have recognized it. Like you're not listening to me. (laughs) I didn't recognize it that day, but within two days, I totally recognized that Renee had changed everything before me. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Great leadership. And great jokes. Oh, I can't believe jokes, it's yeah. National Joke Day and we did nothing because bad leadership is a joke. How about that? Yeah, we're good at this. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. So you could spend more time getting the joke repertoire to on. Oh, oh, what did the teacher do with the student's report on cheese? Poked holes in it. She graded it. Oh. What's the easiest way to make a glowworm happy? Cut off its tail. It'll be delighted. What does a clock do when it's hungry? It goes back four seconds. I love it. They're doing a Haven Life because they're committed to offering a modern way to buy life insurance. Their application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. More laughing. I think more laughing makes you uh, makes you live longer, doesn't it? It does. Have we done studies about that? Smiling. And uh, although I think we need better jokes than those ones. Okay. How about, how about this one? What do you call fly without wings? What's that? A walk. Okay. No. All right. Uh, <sighs> let's uh, throw out the even lifeline right now. Why don't we? Hi guys, this is Frank in Indiana. First of all, thanks for putting on a great show and making the subject entertaining and informative at the same time. I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I will be getting approximately $500 a month raise uh, due to an upcoming promotion. Currently, my wife and I max out our Roth IRAs every year, and we've been doing this since our early 20s. I also put away about $9,000 a year into my Roth TSP. We have about $430,000 total in our retirement accounts, 80% of which is in Roths, and are 37 years old. Ideally, I would like to be retired by age 60, assuming I have a military retirement, but would like the flexibility to retire sooner if possible, but probably not before 55. Do you think I would be better off putting some of the extra investable funds in a regular brokerage account or keep packing it into my Roth TSP? My fear is getting to age 55 and wanting to retire, but being stuck because all my funds are tied up in an account that can't be accessed until age 59 and a half. I also have one child, age six, who does not have any type of custodial accounts at this point, such as a 529. However, I fully transferred my GI Bill to him for his future education, which should cover the majority of uh, a four-year college expenses, but there's no way to be sure. 
do you think allocating some of this extra money to a regular brokerage account would give me some better flexibility with both those scenarios? And is it worth it to even split hairs over it at this point in my life? Thank you for your time. Thanks for the kind words and for the question, Frank. And a nice job already doing some saving OG, thinking about the tax consequences. I think also thinking about it at uh, mid-30s is a great time to be thinking up about how am I going to start withdrawing this money? Where's the right place to withdraw from? Instead of getting all of the optimization today, also looking at, uh, at the future, which we don't see enough. So nice job, Frank. What do you think, OG? I always come back to the idea of if you had $50 million in your 401k, would you really care if you had to pay a penalty? And the answer is almost for everyone, nah, I wouldn't care. So be it. So I think the first order of business is make sure that you get enough money saved. If you use a tax advantaged account, whether it's pre-tax going in, tax deferred and then taxable on the way out, or it's after tax going in, tax deferred and tax free out, that's going to provide you with more money than money sitting in your brokerage account. Just the tax deferral and the tax free benefits or the tax deferred benefits up front will allow you to invest fewer dollars to get bigger bang for your buck. So if you're on track for your goals and you have extra money, then you can start playing the game of where do I want to put it, right? But until then, I think you have to take advantage of all the advantages that you have. And some of those are, I still have X dollars available in my 401k that I can contribute. And that's going to give you a bigger bang for the buck than the traditional brokerage account because you don't have to pay taxes along the way. The other thing that I think uh, is this big myth is, well, I can't touch my money till I'm 59 and a half. So, you know, I guess I can't to retire till then. No, that's not true. You can, you can get your money long before then. So with retirement plans through work, like workplace, 401ks, TSPs, those sorts of things, if you retire after 55, but before 59 and a half, you can access your money penalty free. You might have to still pay taxes depending on where the funds were pre or after tax, but it's penalty free after 55. Any time before that, you can access your retirement funds as long as you follow some simple rules that the IRS puts out. Eh, maybe simple is not the right word, but you have to follow some rules and you can get your money uh, without any penalty. And then thirdly, you're talking about Roth IRA money. Roth IRA money, as long as the money's been there five years, you can take your money out at any time also, your contributions. That's the key right there, I think. So, yeah, hey, I've been putting six grand a year in. My wife's been putting six grand a year in. We're 35. We're going to do this until we're 55. What happens if I want to retire early? You know, if you if you do it for 30 years, 6,000 a year for 30 years, it's 180 grand, right? Times two, 360 grand. That's just your contributions. That money can come out tax free you take anytime you want. So don't get hung up on, well, boy, I'd really like to retire, but you know, can't, no, no. The penalties for withdrawing money from workplace plans or from IRAs or qualified retirement accounts are in existence to prevent people who don't have enough money from doing it, which by the way, don't prevent people from not doing it. <laughs> they just go, well, whatever, I'll just pay the penalty. It's like, you realize it's 10% plus taxes. Yeah, I'm, whatever, I'm good. I'll take it. <laughs> like, it doesn't prevent anything, but whatever. It gives you a little sting. If you have enough money, the IRS is totally cool with you retiring at 48 and having all your money in your 401k. They don't care. They're like, yeah, we're good. You're good. We're, we're okay with that. You just have to follow some different rules. So don't let that age thing hang you up. I think there's a far bigger chance that you're going to be financially successful, be financially independent at 50. And then somebody's going to say to you, Hey, why don't you retire? You got all this money, you got a pension you and stuff. And you're going to go, why would I retire? I like what I'm doing. So I'm going to keep doing it. Or you're going to say, what happens to a lot of people we talk to? Hey, I'm financially independent. Why don't I retire? Because those idiots are paying me a couple hundred grand a year to do the thing I like to do. So, you know, I got a ninth grader. What? I can't go anywhere. I might as well keep working and make another million dollars over the next five years. You know? So that, I don't mean let off the gas. That's not what I mean by that. But I'm saying like, if you're there and you're ready to go, there's a way to do it. You just have to get a little creative on how to do it. So short answer to your question is dump the money in the Roth until you can't do it anymore. And then after that, yeah, put money in the brokerage account. And And that's not to say, OG, that you don't like money in a brokerage account because you do. You and I both like that flexibility, but he's got room for more in the Roth. And and if he does, then heck, let's fill that up because that money will be available. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Good stuff. Just gets rid of a little friction, Frank. And uh, ain't nobody like friction. Don't need any friction. With their money. Yes. 
it's funny because friction and money is a lot like friction that you see in like communications one-on-one. You've got a sender and a receiver, right? And then you've got noise, which is friction in the message. People don't get the entire message. It's the same thing with, with taxes. I feel you put the money in, you've got friction along the way and you either put more, you get more money out or you don't. Friction is the tax person. It's investing in stuff. Inflation is friction, right? Want to reduce the effects of friction. There we go. We just made money and science come together. Speaking of science, OG, I was reading a book on helium and I couldn't put it down. Oh, come come on. Nothing? (laughs) All right. Hey, that's going to do it for today, everybody. Big thanks to a lot of people. What an action-packed episode. So glad that you were able to spend time with us. A few things I want to point out. Big thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this show. We've received such nice reviews from so many people lately. Here's one from the end of July from Frankie6868. Uh, great fun podcast, five stars. This podcast is great. I'm not sure what the two guys are there for though, because I listen to hear their neighbor Doug's trivia. Haven't learned anything since the results from Len Penzo sandwich survey, which by the way, we had on Frankie just for you right after you wrote this, uh, but that's okay. Maybe they'll have him on again sometime. And we did directly after Frankie just for you. And one of our favorite episodes of the year. And I think uh, today's episode, man, Rachel Pacheco, OG just brought it. Last but not least, if you know somebody that should listen to this episode or should be getting into this, we have done something new. We've created Stacky Benjamin starter packs where, because shows are all over the place. If you're looking for shows in a certain specific area, Brooke Miller on our team has made some starter packs for you to organize those into easy to listen to subjects. So instead of getting the smattering all over time, like we try to do, if you're really focusing on one area, you know, somebody's focused on an area that'll give them a head start. Last but not least, speaking of starting, if you're starting to wonder if you need to make a lot better financial decisions and need to be the dumbest person in the room, need to surround yourself with better people, OG and his team are taking new clients. You'll find OG's calendar for he and his team at stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG. And that'll set up the first meeting to talk about how they can interface with you to make better decisions in the future. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you got us from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headline, conservatorships. I'm not sure that Britney Spears needs one, but if you have a special needs family member, a conservatorship when done well can help everyone involved. Second, take a lesson from Rachel Pacheco. Upping your boss game? Communicate early and often to create a solid feedback loop, and you're well on your way to success. But the big lesson? I don't know. This show's actually pretty boring when we're not joking around. Wouldn't you much rather hear a joke like, why are teddy bears never hungry? Because they're always stuffed. <laughs> you just, that stuff's amazing. Why, why would anybody not want to have that on the show? T. Oaken. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. To learn more about how you can step up as a boss, grab Rachel's book, Bringing Up the Boss, Practical Lessons for New Managers. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2021, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by Taylor Stevens with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen, check out our show notes page written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. Brooke and Joe also collaborate on a guide to the show and with lots of extras we couldn't include on today's podcast. Heck, they'll also throw in some life money lessons from Joe and it's all free. It's called The Stacker. And you'll find it at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. Once we get all of this goodness bottled up, it goes over to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart, who helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to talk about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group, The Basement. She also is our social media coordinator. So say hello when you see us posting online. 
Here's a weird fact. She and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. For a URL that'll take you right to our Facebook group, by the way, type stackingbenjamins.com forward slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and the people responsible for this show have been sacked. Okay, it's it, just one more joke we cut from the show because of the boycott, and, the, and I'll be done. I, pro- I promise I'll be done. What's the best way to watch fishing on TV? Live stream, of course. What? One? More, you want me to do one more? Yeah, you're right. I, I can't leave you with that one. How, how about this one? What do you call a dog that can do magic? A labracadabrador. <laughs> Oh, wait, this one's good, too. Uh, What did the drummer call his twin daughters? And a one and a two. You guys want a money one? I can do a hundred. One money one. Okay, one money one. What do you call 50 pigs and 50 deer? 10,000 bucks. Think about it. It's going to hit you in a second. These are good. But to be truthful, there are other types of puns I like. For example, do I like courtroom puns? Guilty. Welcome to the after show. Oh, gee, I am so happy that it is National Joke Day because I saw a film based on a Disney ride that is all about bad puns. Is is there such a thing as a bad pun? Good puns, great puns. Uh, This is a film starring Emily Blunt and a guy named Dwayne Johnson, and it's called Jungle Cruise. Legend has it there is a tree in the Amazon that possesses unparalleled healing powers. And the arrowhead is the key to unlocking it. Stop her! Hello. Uh, just wanted you to know this has been mislabeled. Uh. He's shipping outlets? Of all the jungle cruises you can take in the Amazon, this one is undoubtedly the cheapest, but also the most thrilling. Heads up, coming through. Look out! Marauders. Natives. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for. The backside of water. Which, if you've ever been on the Juggle Cruise ride, you know that's one of the craziest jokes on that ride. Just an aside, Walt Disney, when they created the Jungle Cruise, was really thought that this could be an educational experience. And they put their animatronics around the rivers and took people through. Well, the only person that thought that the ride wasn't cheesy and a little bit backward was Walt Disney. Everybody who worked on it began making fun of it openly in front of the crew and they get some laughs and reports say that Disney himself would uh, put on a disguise and would go on the jungle cruise and employees would be reprimanded (laughs) for making bad jokes, which is specifically what the ride's known for. And the amazing thing to me when I go on the jungle cruise ride is how many people either, Oh gee, don't get that. Don't know that that's the, that is the tradition on this ride because I'm always sitting in the back of the damn boat, cracking my butt up and everybody staring at the captain just with their mouth open and not even zero laughter, except Cheryl and I in the back of the boat, uh, just about wetting my pants. Cause it's so damn funny. I never did the jungle cruise. 
You never did? No. I think it was closed or something last time we were there. My favorite Jungle Cruise skipper joke was we're coming up on the hippopotamus and the woman says, oh no, they could turn over this boat in a hurry and they will kill us all. Hold on a second. I'll get rid of him the same way I got rid of my last boyfriend. Throws down the little microphone, runs to the edge of the boat and goes, I love you. Let's move in together. There, they'll never bother us again. Nice. It was so good. Uh, but Jungle Cruise, the movie, how was it? They actually pay homage to what I just told you at the beginning. Uh, Dwayne Johnson has a bunch of people on the boat and he's cracking them left and right. And they're all just staring at him. So they even pay homage to the fact that half the people riding the damn ride don't get it. Don't even get it. Got it. No. So Emily Blunt plays the part of this woman who knows where a uh, secret artifact is. The tear of life, which is the petal from a tree, which can cure lots of diseases. And she's hoping to help the world by finding this. So she goes deep into the jungle, finds Dwayne Johnson, who pretends he's somebody else to get the job and uh, hilarity ensues. This movie, if you're someone who likes action and humor and some family cheese is phenomenal. I like this movie better than I liked Black Widow. And I like Black Widow a lot. I thought Black Widow was fine. This is my favorite movie of the summer. It was, it was so fun. It was so intentionally dumb and <laughs> full of, full of surprises. I didn't know where the plot was going on at least three different areas. It was a super, super fun summer ride. If you're looking for some family fun summer entertainment, I can't say enough good things about this movie. I, I thought it was great. Okay, I'm gonna do it. It was uh, we almost did it. Ye- we almost watched it yesterday because you can watch it on Disney Plus, pay the little bit extra, and and, and you get to watch it. But uh, I took a nap instead. I'll do it this week. Your kids will like it. One of the only films I've been to, I've been to maybe five films where people clapped at the end. People clapped at the end of this one. Yeah, good stuff. I think this one is severely underrated. I think it has like a six on a scale of one to ten on the Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, I was a big fan. Titus and Tate, a podcast from two obsessed basketball lovers. Do you think Milwaukee will attract free agents now? Like, like I, I mean, not even not even free agents, but players that are, are championship level player, like a not a, not a Jeff Green in particular, but those Jay Crowder type players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're say, not saying I want to go. The, not those players specifically, but they're going to say I want to go play with the best player. Yeah, I want to be a part of that. That's yeah. what happened with Michael. More than just analysts and stats. Titus and Tate. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.